I'm Dwight Drummond. Tonight, as concern grows over the COVID Delta variant, Ontario moves to get more vaccine into hot spots. We are further expanding booking eligibility for an accelerated second dose in select regions across the province. We'll tell you which areas are being targeted and when the Delta variant is likely to become the dominant strain. And as a bill that builds on the important safeguards passed by this legislature to defend the essential voice of Ontarians in their own elections. A brazen attempt to uh, hold on to power. They're supposed to be on summer break, but the Ford government's plan to invoke a rarely used part of the Canadian Constitution has MPPs in fighting form at Queen's Park. Plus, details on today's court appearance by the man accused in the deadly truck attack on a Muslim family. First tonight, starting Monday, Ontarians in seven different regions, including Toronto and the GTA, can start booking their second COVID vaccines. Provincial health officials say it's key to prevent a fourth wave as the Delta variant becomes dominant. Data shows that two doses is more than twice as effective as one when it comes to the Delta variant. Alicia Son has the latest on the push to get Ontario fully vaccinated. Starting Monday, Ontario is taking big strides in getting second doses into people's arms. Beginning Monday, June 14th at 8 a.m., individuals who live in Halton, Peel, Porcupine, Toronto, Waterloo, Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph, and York Public Health Units, and who received their first dose on or before May 9th, will be able to book a second dose appointment. Why these areas? Because these public health units are reporting more cases of the Delta variant. The variant that hit India so hard is here, and it is on track to be the dominant form of the virus uh, this summer. But we believe we can control it with the right actions. The main objective is getting everyone fully vaccinated. So, starting Monday, appointments can be booked through the provincial or local public health portals, participating pharmacies, and later in June, we'll see second-dose pop-up clinics at workplaces here. Beginning the week of June 20th in Peel, York, and Toronto. Ontario will be receiving hundreds of thousands of vaccines in the coming weeks and to cut down on wastage before allocating new vaccines to these regions. We are asking them to use the what they have in their uh, in their freezers. And here's a catch. Second doses are only being accelerated for those whose first shot was either Pfizer or Moderna. If you got the AstraZeneca shot, you still have to wait 12 weeks before getting your second dose, regardless if you opt for another AstraZeneca or an mRNA vaccine. The province says there's not enough data available yet to show how shortening the interval could impact the efficacy. The risk of exposure is highest now. Doctors say Ontario is making a mistake here. We need to shorten that period and get people their second dose of AstraZeneca as soon as possible. There's no reason to, to wait for 12 weeks for the AstraZeneca mm. vaccine. Especially when the province starts lifting restrictions tomorrow. Just get people their second dose. Dr. Adelstein Brown says it's key to preventing a fourth wave. This is not a doomsday scenario. Uh, we believe that if we're able to follow, uh, you know, really continue a community, a high risk community focused vaccination strategy, uh, to do that really quickly uh, and expeditiously, that we've got a good chance of controlling the Delta variant and actually. A really good chance of a, a good summer. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Peel Region has hit a vaccine milestone today. I am absolutely thrilled to report for the first time right here, right now, that 75% of our residents, 18 plus or older, have now received their first dose of the vaccine. This is our big goal from the start, and reaching it is an incredible achievement. The mayor is also expressing concern about the rise of the virus variants in Peel. She says 30% of all new COVID cases in the region are the Delta variant. She stressed the importance of accelerating second doses in the region, particularly for essential workers. This is the summer break for politicians at Queen's Park, but the legislature was anything but quiet today. MPPs have been called back to debate a controversial bill from the Ford government that could make history in our province. Lorenda Redekop explains. All those in favour of the motion will please say aye. Aye. All those opposed will please say nay. nay. 
the government side easily won first reading of the bill to limit third-party advertising. It would double the restricted spending period to 12 months before an election, but keep the spending limit of $600,000. We are using it specifically to ensure uh, fair elections in the province of Ontario, and I'm quite proud of that. An earlier version of the bill was passed in the spring, but it was challenged in court by unions, who said it infringed on their rights to free speech. A Superior Court judge sided with them this week before the government decided to introduce the bill again, this time invoking the notwithstanding clause. We cannot afford another four In the last election, the pro-conservative group Ontario Proud was one of the biggest third-party spenders, attacking the Liberals. The bill would limit their spending, along with other third-party groups like unions. The opposition says this is about silencing critics. There's no need for it whatsoever. But Doug Ford, you know, he likes to use a big club. Uh, he, likes to, he likes to hit hard uh, and crush his opponents. This is what happened the last time the Ford government threatened to invoke this clause when a court initially ruled against them on cutting the size of Toronto City Council in half. One professor says it's always a risky move. It's the triggering of the notwithstanding clause that becomes the story. And it's not a story that Ontarians normally want to hear. Um, they normally react very badly to the ousting of the courts like this, and they don't respond well to politicians that do it. So this is not a uh, politically uh, astute move in my view. One lawyer, formerly chief of staff to Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper, says this bill goes too far. You want to talk about wildlife? Well, you're covered by this law. You want to, you know, put up flyers on COVID vaccine, you're covered by this law. So it's, it's quite an overreaching law, and it does a lot more than the government is saying it does. A lot more. This House stands adjourned until Monday. The plan had been to sit all weekend, including an overnight sitting, to quickly pass this. But instead, MPPs will be back Monday morning for second reading of the bill. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. The father of the man accused in a deadly attack against a Muslim family in London is calling it, quote, a senseless act. Mark Veltman says what happened was an unspeakable crime. His son, Nathaniel, made a virtual court appearance today. He doesn't have a lawyer yet and is set to be back in court on, in a few days. Five members of one family were hit by a pickup truck on Sunday. Four of them were killed. One remains in hospital. CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick now with the latest. Nathaniel Veltman made a brief court appearance by video link from the London Detention Centre where he's been in custody since he was arrested. He was wearing orange prison-issued clothing and a blue mask, making it difficult to see any facial expressions. The 20-year-old with short, light-coloured hair said little during the appearance, which only lasted a few minutes, answering brief questions when asked by the judge. The next court appearance is scheduled for June 14th. He's expected to retain a lawyer before then. Muslim community leader Faisal Joseph watched the proceeding online and had mixed emotions emotions seeing the accused. You try and keep your emotions in balance, but they certainly weren't positive emotions. I kind of wanted to get a good look at, you know, what that much hatred looks like. Feltman is facing four charges of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. That last charge relates to the nine-year-old boy who survived. He's in hospital recovering from his injuries. His father, Salman, his mother, Medea, his sister, Yumna, and his grandmother, Talat, were all killed Sunday night while the whole family was out for a walk. Police allege Veltman deliberately drove his pickup truck into them and targeted them because they're Muslim. Veltman was arrested minutes later in the parking lot of a shopping mall not far from where the crash happened. Police say they received a 911 call that led them to find the suspect there. They've been tight-lipped about other details to do with the investigation. They have said further charges are possible depending on how the investigation proceeds. Some in the Muslim community want to see terrorism-related charges laid too. This defense lawyer says that could take some time to determine. All it really is is a different mode of proving criminal liability. So it actually is encompassed in the first-degree murder charge, and we might not see it until we have the trial or in the preliminary inquiry where they'll set out whether or not they want to cover uh, that area. As, uh, as you've indicated, it's very rarely used. Seems like here is a stark example of where it might be completely utilized in, uh, to, to satisfy exactly why the legislation was included. Meanwhile, the City of London continues to mourn the loss of four of its citizens. Preparations are underway for funerals. Those will take place on Saturday. Megan Fitzpatrick, CBC News, London, Ontario. A motion put forward at Queen's Park today condemning Islamophobia was denied unanimous consent by the Ford government.
I seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice, condemning all forms of Islamophobia and reaffirming the Legislature's support for anti-racism directorate, and that the question be put immediately. Agreed? No. Heard a no. Liberal MPP Mitzi Hunter introduced the motion. PC MPP Khalid Rashid tweeted the, his reaction to the motion, saying Hunter used the tragedy in London for partisan purposes. Peel police are investigating a video showing the burning of a pride flag circulating at a Mississauga school. They say it's being investigated as a hate-motivated incident. Students say school administration isn't doing enough to promote inclusion. It's very reflective of what I experienced. I was called slurs when I went to this school. Um, I felt a lot of homophobia directed towards me. I had people told me that they don't like gay people, but that because I wasn't as feminine, it was different. I'm just really upset and enraged. And like, I came to the school thinking that things would be different, thinking that it would be so accepting and that I wouldn't have to deal with problems like this. And then this happens and um, really I have no words for it. Video of the incident has been circulating on social media and shows a group of students burning the flag near Cothwell Park Secondary. Both the school and Peel School Board have issued a joint statement condemning the incident, calling it a hateful act. So far, police have not made any arrests. The Ottawa Red Blacks say that they have suspended defensive lineman Chris Larson following an ongoing investigation into an alleged beating at the ferry docks on the Toronto Island over the weekend. We brought you the story yesterday. David Gomez identified himself as the victim when he contacted by CBC. He says he was walking with his roommate to the ferry to head back to the mainland on Saturday night when a man on a bicycle started trailing him. When they got to the ferry dock, he says several other individuals circled them and started hurling homophobic slurs. Police say a woman then grabbed the victim and two men from a group punched and kicked him. Toronto police are investigating it as a hate crime. Meanwhile, the Red Blanks parent company says they were made aware of social media allegations of an assault that included Chris Larson. He was suspended by the team last night as the investigation into the incident continues. So far, no charges have been laid. The City of Toronto has plans to crack down on massive beach parties. We'll have the details on that coming up. And is it beach party weather, Nick? <laughs> You know, I think it is, Dwight. Uh, I mean, one thing you might have noticed today is that it's notably less humid. Uh, yesterday, we had temperatures around 28, 29 degrees. The, humi uh, the Humidex, though, making it feel closer to about 36. Now, today, temperatures coming down a little bit, but there is no Humidex to speak of. There's a look at currents, uh, and that's actually our high for today. So 24 degrees across the region, 25 down in uh, St. Catharines. Now, watch as I flip to the next board here, Humidex. Nothing changes, really. I mean, we've got a couple points that come on down in St. Catharines, but otherwise, 24. So really not much to speak of in terms of humidity. That's also going to lead to slightly cooler uh, temperatures through the overnight. It'll be a little bit more fresh heading into the overnight. Also comes under clear skies. Now, we had some thunderstorm activity yesterday across the region. As we head through tonight, we're looking at generally clear skies, more stable air as well, and uh, that's what you can expect heading into uh, tomorrow. So forecast-wise, for the next 24, looks like this, 16 degrees tonight, tomorrow up to a high of 25. Again, not much to speak of in terms of humidity. Now, there is the chance of a little bit of rainfall heading into the weekend, but most of it actually comes through the overnight. We'll have your full forecast coming up in just a bit. Dwight. See you in a while. Thank you, Nick. Bet. This weather update is brought to you by TRAIN. For a limited time, take advantage of 36 equal payments and 0% financing. It's hard to stop a train. City Council passed a motion this week aimed at keeping weekend parties at the beach under control. It involves a heavier police presence and quicker cleanup. Greg Ross is live at Woodbine Beach for us tonight. And Greg, what is that is where the city says the bulk of the problems have been this year? Yeah, that's right. It's been very busy, uh, Dwight, the last few weekends, particularly Victoria Day long weekend. Now, the city isn't trying to discourage people from coming down to enjoy the beach, but they say that some of the people that are coming simply aren't respecting the beach. Uh, everything from parties with loud music, fireworks, uh, and of course, people just leaving trash everywhere. And the people that live near here say it's time to stop. The message from City Councillor Brad Bradford is clear. Come and enjoy the beach, but do it responsibly. Big parties of thousands of people is, is not what we're looking to do on the beaches right now. 
And to keep things under control, the new motion passed by City Council this week will bring in reinforcements. More police and bylaw officers will be patrolling the beach, and they won't only be looking for people breaking pandemic restrictions. And frankly, there's been a lot of behavior that's always illegal, you know, whether we're talking about garbage or litter or firing off fireworks indiscriminately into a crowd of people, that's never permitted, and that behavior is unacceptable. The idea of a beefed-up police presence garnered mixed reaction from residents. I haven't felt much of issues in terms of safety. I think there needs to be a little bit more enforcement than there has been. You know, nice and light, but just the presence would be helpful. There's 10,000 people down here. How many tickets are you going to give? The motion also addressed issues with trash. The Parks Department will bring in additional staff on weekends for cleanup. They've also added more garbage receptacles and will empty them more frequently. We have more than 200 right now, so we're going to increase the pickup frequency. We're going to add a, a, an additional shift where folks are coming by midday to empty those bins to stay on top of it. That's an issue that all residents seem to agree on. Cleanup is great. I find there's a lot of people who live here that just come down on a Monday morning and are cleaning up themselves, just neighbours, and helping out the city staff because it does get pretty messy. It's a park. It needs to be maintained. Another issue that they've been having here uh, in recent weeks is illegal parking. People blocking driveways, laneways and transit routes. So Bradford says this weekend they're going to start towing cars as well. A lot more. In fact, uh, they're going to be friendly tows this weekend where they're going to take cars that are illegally parked and they're going to move them to another location. Dwight. Thank you, Greg. Peel police have made a third arrest in connection with a fatal shooting at a Mississauga restaurant. Investigators say 20-year-old Anna Nath of Mississauga has been arrested in Montreal. He's wanted in a shooting late last month at the Chickenland restaurant. 25-year-old Naeem Akel was killed. A number of his family members were injured. Earlier this week, a 31-year-old Brampton man and a 25-year-old Mississauga man were also arrested. They're both facing first-degree and attempted murder charges. And a woman was found shot to death outside a business in a rural area of Mississauga last night. The victim has been identified as 22-year-old Marissa Radshake. Peel's homicide unit has taken over the investigation, but currently has no lead on a suspect. Linda Ward has more. This is one of the last pockets of green space in an otherwise developed area on the Mississauga-Oakville border. This is Ninth Line, just south of Burnham Thorpe. Around 11.30 last night, gunshots echoed along this stretch of rural road. Several people called police, reporting up to 10 shots fired. Upon arrival, our officers and emergency services did in fact locate an adult female suffering from apparent gunshot wounds. And unfortunately, that female has died as a result of the injuries that she sustained. It is a, a rural location. Um, the victim was located outside of a business. And that business is a tree removal company. You can see the barn and several industrial vehicles surrounded by police tape. Police don't know how the woman got here or what led to the shooting. In regards to uh, if the victim is associated to this address, that is unknown at this time. We are still uh, working. It's part of our investigation. Police say the canine and aerial support units will be brought in to help search the area. There aren't too many homes around here, only a couple of businesses along the stretch of road. But one family who's lived here for 32 years tell me they've never seen trouble here before. It, it, it should not happen. It should not happen here. It should not happen anywhere. It hasn't sunk in really yet. I mean, it's an abandoned, empty area, so bad things usually happen in those spots where there's no witnesses, right? And that's a problem for police. They're looking for anyone who saw anything or who may have surveillance video, both scarce at a rural scene like this. They say at this point they have no information on any suspects or any vehicles they're looking for. Linda Ward, CBC News, Mississauga. A Mississauga teen was caught up in an online terror plot and sent to the most secure prison in the United States. Now his parents want him back in Canada. Because he attempted to suicide five times in prison due to the depression. This is why his transfer is very, very important. More on how the now 20-year-old found himself convicted of planning to plant bombs in New York City and his family's push to have him transferred back home coming up next. 
A GTA family is fighting to have their mentally ill son transferred from the most secure prison in the U.S. to a Canadian facility. The man was 17 when he was caught up in an online terror plot to plant bombs in New York City. His family claims he's been denied medication and treatment in prison, and they're pleading with the authorities to let him serve the remainder of his sentence in Canada. John Lancaster has the story. The situation right now is very risky, and he can lose his life anytime. Usama El Banasawi says it's become a matter of life and death. His son, Abdul Rahman, was a 17-year-old diagnosed with a severe bipolar disorder and off his meds when he met an undercover FBI agent in an online chat room back in 2015. From his parents' home in Mississauga, he agreed to take part in a plot to plant bombs in New York City. While the plot was never carried out, Abdul Rahman was sentenced to 40 years in a U.S. prison. Recently, he was transferred here to the most secure prison in the U.S., Colorado's ADX Supermax, where inmates are housed in solitary confinement in soundproof cells for 23 hours a day. El Banasawi has no access to his psychiatric medicine or treatment and is fading fast in the U.S. prison system, according to his family. He attempted to suicide five times in prison due to the depression. This is why his transfer is very, very important, because in U.S., the, he is not a U.S. citizen, so he's not eligible to go to a prison where is a, a mental health facility attached to it. The family aren't the only ones calling for a transfer to a Canadian prison where El Banasawi could serve a sentence and get treatment. I don't think we've done the right thing by him. And in that sense, I don't think we've done the right thing by our country in safety and security. Psychiatrist and retired U.S. Army General Stephen Zanakis says El Banasawi's psychiatric issues may have made him easy pickings for security officials. Security should be directed to the people that are really dangerous, who are really enemies. And just because a person's mentally ill, that doesn't make them an enemy. Both Canada and the U.S. have a prisoner transfer agreement. Essentially, both sides would have to agree to the move, but neither country will tell CBC News if or when that might happen. Former U.S. federal prosecutor Andrew Frisch says it should. He's not Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11. He's not Ted Bundy. He's not Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. He's a disturbed teenager. The family hopes the decision won't come too late. We would never stop fighting for Abdurrahman. We would never stop fighting for those kind of vulnerable, voiceless, mentally ill people. John Lancaster, CBC News, Toronto. The Federal Privacy Commissioner says the RCMP violated Canada's privacy laws when it used facial recognition technology. Clearview AI is the company behind the software. It has a database of more than 3 billion images collected from the Internet without people's consent. Clearview sells access to that database to law enforcement agencies, including the RCMP. In his report, the commissioner said the police service violated the privacy of Canadians by using the database. The RCMP doesn't use the software anymore, but it disagreed with the findings, saying the, soft, the software rather is useful to track down criminals or to find missing people. The report recommended the service improve its policies, systems and training when it comes to the use of facial recognition technology. For the first time since 2019, the leaders of the G7 are about to hold a face-to-face -face summit. Prime Minister Trudeau arrived in Cornwall, England today. The pandemic, of course, on the agenda, but it's not the only topic up for debate. More on that after the break. Researchers are learning more and more about COVID-19 every day, but one big mystery remains. Why do some people who get the disease develop long-lasting symptoms, what's become known as COVID long haulers? Researchers, healthcare professionals, and people living with the disease came together today to try to find some answers. Philip Lishanak has the story. You feel like, okay, you're feeling better, but then all of a sudden your body starts shutting down completely. It's like turning the lights off. This tech executive went from being energetic and athletic to being unable to move or even talk like she used to. Her muscle, nervous, and immune systems were impacted. A five-minute walk would make her feel wiped out. Initially, doctors were unsure whether she had COVID-19 until she tested positive. 
when I was feeling all these symptoms, uh, the doctors were surprised, were shocked, because I didn't have respiratory issues. I had everything else. A panel today heard similar stories that just like Dagger, early long-haul COVID-19 patients had a hard time being taken seriously. I was told that it couldn't possibly be COVID. One COVID long hauler who has had symptoms for 15 months was first told she couldn't possibly have it. I have ran into barriers of care. I have been told that, you know, I'm um, basically neurotic, that I am anxious. Uh, one doctor told me it was probably menopause. I'm going to give a very high level overview. Researchers on the panel are comparing the experiences of patients with COVID-19 for more than a year. People suffering debilitating symptoms from extreme fatigue to neurological impairment who are seeking treatment but feel abandoned by the healthcare system. This researcher is looking into whether systemic discrimination has played a part. Um, because um, we live in a very multi-ethnic, multi-racial sort of communities, um, especially where I am in Toronto, uh, we do try to have um, uh, inclusion of uh, different um, uh, races and uh, ethnicities. And um, by, um, it's not been uh, the easiest thing. That's because not everyone may feel comfortable sharing their experience. I want the old me back. I want, uh, I want to feel normal. It's been eight months and now she's had a vaccine and is receiving treatment. She hopes by sharing her experiences with researchers, doctors and policymakers, they can learn how to better take care of patients with emerging or novel diseases. Philip Shanock, CBC News, Oakville. Quebec Premier Francois Legault says there's a chance the Ontario-Quebec border could reopen very soon. We are in discussion with uh, the Ontario government, the, the Ford government, and I'm confident that in the next few days we'll be able to open uh, these borders. Ontario's restrictions and interprovincial travel, which came into effect in April, are set to expire on June 16th. That's next Wednesday. Leaders of the G7 are set to meet in Cornwall, England. This is their first face-to-face -face summit since 2019. COVID-19, economic recovery and vaccine in inequity rather are topping the agenda. CBC's Tessa Arcilia has the latest. The picturesque seaside village of Carbis Bay, calm and sleepy, belies the pressure G7 leaders are under to deliver. Answers, solutions, action especially when it comes to the urgent need of ensuring vaccine access for all. The United States will purchase a half a billion doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine to donate to nearly 100 nations that are in dire need in the fight against this pandemic. With no strings attached, a pledge that ups the pressure on other leaders to give more. But Robin Niblett, director of the think tank Chatham House, says it's not so easy for countries to make those pledges. There's this wonderful phrase inside the G7 health communique, when domestic circumstances permit. So they might want to stop uh, the inequity of a one-sided global vaccine rollout, but the pure domestic politics of it means that the bulk of it will be done at home first before it is taken to other parts of the world. While more than 44% of the world's richest countries have been vaccinated, it's less than 1% for the world's poorest. A gap so wide, a growing number of voices are sounding the alarm. Director General of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control has this message for the G7 leaders. You make the right bold decisions now. Even though you don't have a global population electing you into office, you are elected to lead and therefore lead and make the right decisions for everyone. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau arrived at the summit today, his first foreign trip in more than a year. Canada is donating money to the global vaccine sharing program COVAX, but has yet to pledge vaccine doses. Tessa Arcilia, CBC News, Cornwall. The federal Green Party has lost one of the three federal MPs it had in the House of Commons. Jenica Atwin announced today she was joining the Liberals. David Common has more on the move and its impact. I know that my liberal... All smiles and now all liberals as a bright green light turns red. The color of my team uh, does not compromise who I am or what I will continue to do for this riding. 
The green hope was that Jenica Atwin's breakthrough in Fredericton would be the start of something bigger in Atlantic Canada. She joined Elizabeth May and Paul Manley to give the Greens a caucus of three, now cut down to two. Um, again, I never expected this day to come. It came in part because of internal Green Party disagreement over Israel. When party leader Annamie Paul called for a de-escalation of violence between Israel and Hamas, Atwin tweeted the statement was inadequate and wrote she supported Palestine. It's been really difficult to focus on the important work that needs to be done on behalf of my constituents, um, so it certainly has played a role. In the Liberal caucus, uh, there is enormous room for respectful conversation, for differences of opinion. There will have to be. Atwin has opposed the Trans Mountain Pipeline, criticized the Liberal record on climate and reconciliation. I have never had anything but incredibly positive things to say about her. I was looking forward to campaigning for her in the next election. Paul says she was surprised by the move, doesn't agree with it, but claims Atwin's conversations with the Liberals predate the controversy over Israel. None of those uh, reasons touched upon me, and her decision uh, predated, uh, not her decision, but her approach to the Liberals um, pre, uh, uh, well predated uh, the events um, uh, that you mentioned. Paul says the voters of Fredericton should get to decide at the earliest opportunity if they want to be represented by a Liberal. That could happen quite soon as a federal election is expected later this year. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. If you've ever rented a place, you've probably wondered what the previous tenants paid, and that information isn't always easy to find. But now there's a website in Quebec where former tenants can keep the incoming tenants aware. As Laura McCallum reports, the group behind it hopes it will stop landlords from hiking the price every time someone moves out. Pascal Huynh has been living in this seven and a half room apartment in downtown Montreal for the past five years. He says the previous tenants paid $1,000, but Huynh didn't know that and ended up paying $500 more. Now five people are crammed into the space to make ends meet. When we are raising those rents like that at, at such a, a rapid, um, at a rapid rate like that, where the minimum wage is not catching up as fast, uh, we are we're pushing people like us, um, students, artists, um, to have to uh, recourse in, in, in cramming each other into uh, impossible conditions. A non-profit web design company has now created Registesdesloyers.Quebec, a tool that allows tenants to register their rent to let new tenants know what they are paying. The hope is that they will be able to contest a massive rent hike at the rental board within a year, as is the law. Publishing the information and accessing the information on the uh, on the website makes people aw aware of their rights and they can get information that uh, otherwise just relies on good faith. Huynh has already registered his rent and hopes others will do the same. In hopes that the next person who's going to take, a, take uh, this apartment will know uh, what we were paying and can fight the landlord. But Quebec's largest landlord association is dismissing the registry. For us, it has no legal value. It doesn't mean that the information there is accurate and, uh, and we don't see it as something uh, dangerous for, for landlords because the information is not accurate. Housing rights activists welcome the new registry, but they say it should be a mandatory public government regulated website that has enough teeth to prevent landlords from raising rents as they please. Lauren McCallum, CBC News, Montreal. After a decade of working on the beds that line Rossonsville's Avenue, a group of volunteer gardeners is walking away, citing a soured relationship with the local BIA. I, I can't believe that they would go back to sort of the old-fashioned kind of formal gardening. I, I think that the people who uh, instigated this idea have just totally misjudged the nature of the community. For 10 years, the volunteers favored plants that are native and pollinator-friendly, but a small number of businesses have been loudly pushing for a more uniform look. The BIA says it tried to find middle ground with the volunteers where they would still give input, but in the end, communication broke down and a new company has been hired to take over. The BIA says it is hopeful the relationship can still be mended, but the volunteers say many community members fear the new flower beds won't match the feel of the neighborhood.
And the flowers are doing well right now because we had some rain, we had some sun, and it sounds like, Nick, things are kind of changing today because I don't feel as that heavy wetness in the air that we have for the past little while. Yeah, no kidding. You know, speaking about flowers there, Dwight, the last time I was on the show, I guess a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. we were talking about frost. <laughs> I don't know if you remember That's that. That's true. I do remember that, dude. And, That's and why my, we asked you to leave, Nick. Yes, I know. And, <laughs> and my wife's plants were on life support there because we didn't cover them that night. Uh -oh. Anyway, we did manage to revitalize them, but uh, so they're doing okay. We're glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm glad to hear that too, because uh, we had just gotten them about two days before. Um, anyway, here we go. Uh, nice, warm, really summer-like weather. We're pretty much bang on where we should be in terms of temperatures. The average temperature for uh, this time of year, for this day, is 23, 24 degrees, and that's actually where we're sitting right now. That was our high for today. The real muggy weather is in southwestern Ontario, but for us, we've lost that humidity so you notice still a humidex of 38 down in Windsor but for Toronto sitting at 24 which matches the temperature so no humidex to speak of uh, for tonight really not much to speak of coming up over the next couple of days at least uh, generally clear skies we had a little bit of cloud cover earlier today but we're looking at clear skies heading into the overnight period tonight uh, as we head through tomorrow morning again uh, generally sunny skies we're going to see some on and off cloud cover developing across the region there uh, for tomorrow and then especially through the afternoon some areas uh, likely to develop some uh, lake effect thunderstorms and that's more down around the London area maybe Kitchener Waterloo but for Toronto we're looking at uh, and most of the Golden Horseshoe we're looking at just a mix of sun and cloud for the day tomorrow you do see that some cloud cover starts to move in there as we head through Saturday morning and then into Saturday afternoon some instability again developing mostly down in southwestern Ontario but later in the day on Saturday through uh, Saturday night and Sunday morning uh, I think we're going to see some showers maybe even an isolated thunderstorm uh, in areas across the GTA uh, but for the most part staying dry for the weekend the rain that we're expecting to see this weekend largely through the overnights so here's how our forecast plays out for tonight we're looking at temperatures at uh, 15 16 degrees mainly clear skies winds easing as well tomorrow very similar to what we had today highs to about 25 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud uh, across the region now for the next five days plays out like this still looking at a very high UV index and all of these uh, days uh, UV index uh, close to eight or nine so make sure you get the sunscreen on if you're heading out this weekend mix of sun and cloud slight chance we're going to see some spotty showers Friday night into Saturday you'll probably be sleeping though and then Saturday that's that system I had mentioned coming in uh, possibly some lingering showers into Sunday morning otherwise clears up a little bit of a reprieve from the warmer temperatures into Tuesday but all in all Pretty good looking weather, Dwight. Yes, it is, sir. Thank you, Nick. You bet. As we head to break, here's a look at where the markets closed today. The TSX went up by 47 points. The Dow went up by 19. Our dollar traded higher at 82.69 cents US. Stay with us. We're coming right back. Theodore Tugboat was a much-loved popular CBC series for children and a replica of the famous Tug has called the Halifax waterfront home for years. But Theodore too recently said goodbye to his home waters and set sail for Ontario. Here's Colleen Jones with the story of his send-off. I'm on the tugboat Dominion Enforcer and we're crossing Halifax Harbour, or the Big Harbour as it's known in the Theodore Tugboat series. We're meeting up with the star himself, Theodore Two, leaving his home port for new adventures. Have you ever seen a boat with a hat before, Morgan? Morgan McPherson Rideout and his family are here for the final farewell. Came down to see Theodore off. He's flying the Nova Scotia flag uh, and Canadian flag. That's Dennis Campbell. His company, Ambassadors, put Theodore on the market last summer with COVID crushing the tourism season. Bittersweet because, you know, on one hand, you know, you, 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 we hate to see him go, but on the other hand, he's, he's going to go on his new adventure. So with Theodore backing up, I jumped back on the tugboat. Sad to see him go. He's part of, this, part of the, uh, whole, the whole culture here, you know? So uh, we'll see how he makes it up in the fresh water. Bought by Blair McKeel, Theodore's heading to Hamilton, where he'll do educational work with environmental groups Swim, Drink, Fish and Great Lakes Guide, promoting clean, safe water. Peggy's Cove tour operator Peter Richardson is serving as first mate for this trip. This is a big deal. It's a big deal for everybody in Nova Scotia and for us to take it up to St. Lawrence. Before he gets to the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes, Theodore heads up Halifax Harbour for one last trip. He's followed by a flotilla of tugs, 
two from Dominion Diving, two from Atlantic Towing, and of course, the pilot boat. They showed up en masse. They know full well Theodore's role in educating people about the importance of tugs and marine work. It makes Theodore a bit of a rock star in their world. He's a piece of our harbor, you know, there's, uh, I, you know, it's, uh, I was there the day they launched him down in La Haye. I was there with my little girls, who aren't little girls anymore. And, uh, yeah, it's like a, it's like full cycle. Built in Day Spring, Nova Scotia, launched in 2000, Theodore became a favorite on the Halifax waterfront. Where else in the world can you find a tugboat with this smiling face and a red cap? As he made his turn to head out of the harbor, some workers waved goodbye. The pilot boat did a spin in the harbor as a nod of thanks. Theodore too is leaving the safety of the big harbor and who knows what friends and adventures await him on his way to Hamilton. Meanwhile, as we head back without the red cap tug, the harbor, well, it's a little less colorful. Now he's gone, so uh, yeah, I'm sad to see him go. Bye, Theodore. Thanks for the memories. Colleen Jones, CBC News, on the Big Harbor. We promise a warm welcome for Theodore when he gets here. You have to get up pretty early to catch this stunning view. We have more on the solar eclipse and the families who took it all in when we come back. Toronto Maple Leaf Centre Austin Matthews has been named one of the three finalists for the 2021 Hart Trophy. The award is given out annually to the NHL player judged to be the most valuable to his team. This comes after the Leafs suffered a heartbreaking playoff exit almost two weeks ago, which caused Toronto Mayor John Tory to lose a friendly bet with Montreal's mayor. Today, he completed the wager by flying the Montreal Canadian flags at our city hall. I don't uh, make bets very often, occasionally on sports and especially on our Toronto sports teams. And fortunately, I haven't had to pay off too many uh, over the years, but this one, I will admit, was painful. This was painful. Uh, you know, even if I bet a couple of bottles of beer, which I did in this case, a couple of female bacon sandwiches, you know, you can, you can suffer through that. But having to raise the Montreal Canadiens flag, no offense, uh, is among the more difficult things I've had to do uh, since I've been the mayor. No offense, we agree with you, Mayor. Yes, we built a 3-1 lead on Montreal in the first round series before dropping three straight games to the Canadians. The Habs won games five and six in overtime and eliminated the Maple Leafs with a 3-1 victory on May 31st. As if we need reminding, Tory says while it was a disappointing loss, he is confident the Leafs have the talent and management to bring the Stanley Cup home next season. I've heard that one before. Today started with a spectacular sunrise, a partial solar eclipse glowed above the city before 6 a.m. We spoke with some sky gazers who woke up early to catch a glimpse. It's just nice to watch the sunrise. The sun just came through the buildings. I did see a crescent that was beautiful. Me and my husband have seen it when we were a kid, and we wanted our kid to have the same experience. I have spots in my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> when I first saw it, uh, just shock, awe. Uh, you know, for me, uh, being a bit of an astronomy nut, just seeing the moon sitting in front of the sun was amazing. saw like a little dot and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. If I could play the Star Wars music when that was on that would have been perfect. <laughs> I got a solar filter on here for my uh, viewfinder on my telescope. I got this after the last eclipse and we had the uh, Cheerios box with the pinhole and I got snapshots of that and Emma saw that and Henry was too little. <laughs> I don't see that much of the moon anymore. The peak was uh, right when the sun came uh, behind the building, uh, right at uh, sunrise. That was the most beautiful uh, moment. I've never seen something like this before. Spectacular. Mm, 
Not that I did, Nick, but that was definitely worth waking up for. Just spectacular. Yeah, I'm in your camp there, Dwight. I, <laughs> I did not wake up early enough to see it this morning, but if it makes you feel better, there is another one coming in December. The catch is you have to go to Antarctica to see it. <laughs> Start booking your trip. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, beautiful, and I'm glad we had the weather for it as well. Uh, we've had generally clear skies across the region, as I'd mentioned, uh, high pressure more or less in place here. What we've seen is that humidity sort of move out, and that's made for more bearable temperatures. Heading into the tonight, uh, we're looking at generally clear skies and temperatures a little bit little bit cooler than what we've seen over the last few. A bit fresher in terms of the air tonight. Uh, 16 degrees through the overnight light winds. Tomorrow uh, we're looking at a high of 25 degrees. And again, looking back at that long range forecast, uh, basically 25 across the board there. Uh, we've got the risk for some showers on Friday, as I had mentioned, Friday night and a Saturday. Also the risk on Saturday, uh, sort of later afternoon, evening hours. I think we're going to see some thunderstorms and then into Sunday morning. But after that, things start to clear up and we're looking pretty good. As I mentioned, the last time I was here, we were talking about frost. I'm pretty sure I can say we're done with that now. Thank goodness. You are right there, and that board is I'm looking not, good. <laughs> it's yeah. looking good, buddy. And you said that most of the rain is coming at night, right? Yeah, if it does, it's, it's really it's going to be an overnight thing. Thank you, Nick. Glad you to know. have you when nice weather is here. Yeah. <laughs> that is our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 6. We leave you with more stunning shots of this morning's eclipse because I know you probably didn't wake up early to see it either. Have a great night, everybody.